thanks a lot. It's actually it's quite great to, to be here um, every year for, for eight years now. So, um, I'm sure we none of us expected to, to go as long, but there was a lot of interest, and we're really happy to have this event. Um, I'll just jump through and, and um, give you just a few words on free mind. Those of you who don't know us, um, I doubt it. Still, and then I'll try to, to cover some of the um, um, information regarding the budgets available um, and, and, and how we see uh, what would be the best way, the best strategy to maximize um, one's potential to get as much money as possible from this really great source of funding we believe to be a strategic source for the life science uh, marketing and community. So just really briefly, a few words on FreeMind. We've been around for uh, 13 years now. Um, uh, 35 full-time employees, um, just about 400 clients, and we work um, pretty much to do just one thing, try to help our clients get as much money as possible from non dilutive sources. Mainly NIH and DOD, but it goes into the private foundations, etc. I'll, I'll touch on that uh, briefly later. We work both with the academic world, uh, universities, medical schools, medical centers, uh, but mainly with the industry. Anywhere from very small startups to three, four individuals and all, all the way to the very large uh, medical device and pharmaceutical companies, um, you all know them, I won't be able to mention their names. Um, we submit about 300 applications a year for our clients uh, with a track record that is about three to four times the average success rate. Um, and, and we believe, and, and that will be my bottom line uh, at the end of the presentation as well, we believe that our success rate is due to two points, two steps mainly that we, that we take in, in helping our clients um, first of all, identify all relevant funding opportunities. Make sure they take into account not only the obvious places, but also look into every possible pocket of money that may be of relevance to support their specific projects. Um, and so they can weigh the different alternatives and, and, and potential for success and, and um, um, see how they can structure different sources of funding from non-dilutive sources uh, to support their entire uh, portfolio of work. Um, and then the other thing is to present this, uh, their science in the best possible way, taking into account different aspects, so, so the presentation to the reviewers is maximized and you can, you can really uh, do a great job at that, making sure you can get the, 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 their approval. Um, overall, we're looking at a really large pocket of money, and, and, and that is probably the, the, the one thing I want you guys to remember. There's a lot of money out there. It's really competitive, it's very difficult to get to, um, success rates are, are not great, but then again, if you look at any other alternative um, to fund life science research, uh, you know, for a small company, for a large company, doesn't really matter. I don't think the statistics, the, the success rates, if you would go about to try and raise money from a VC today, or a public market, or any other uh, means, will, will be better than, than going for non dilutive funding. Um, and, and if each and every one of you will take a systematic, strategic approach to non dilutive funding, they'll be able to, to get to the same result and to maximize um, their potential. Uh, at NIH, of course, there are many different um, sources of uh, uh, institutes and centers and programs that are designed to support different types of, of uh, uh, projects and activities, literally from very early stage, exploratory type research even, and all the way to late stage clinical <coughs> trial. Um, through other uh, uh, HHS uh, organizations like VARDA, FDA, etc. DOD has different, um, different uh, programs that are designed to support life science research. Uh, and of course, there are many private foundations um, that uh, if any, anyone of you was here last year at, at our seventh annual uh, uh, conference, or not only really funding day, uh, we had a really interesting panel discussion on, on private foundations. So, so all of these uh, represent the world that, that Freemind lives in and, and, and the world that we try to, to step into to bring in um, uh, resources and funding for our clients. Um, another really important point to remember is that almost or even every uh, part in the uh, both drug development and device development process um, could be covered through some kind of non dilutive funding source, mechanism, or institute. Um, literally every aspect of it, every step of the way, um, you know, if you look at this, this slide, looking at the medical device world, you know, from the product design all the way to the, to the regulatory work that needs to be done, there are different mechanisms, different aspects uh, and programs that are designed to support each and every part of it, and, and especially if you look at the drug development uh, process, uh, again, covering each and every part from discovery, very early stage, there are some specific programs and, and, and mechanisms available to, to support that, 
um, uh, going through the different stages, uh, preclinical work, animal testing, of course, um, and then uh, just all the way through to, to, to clinical work, uh, everything can be covered by one uh, type or another of non devoting funding. And it's really up to you to do a thorough, systematic, and strategic work to identify all different funding opportunities available to be able to bring in uh, your, uh, you know, as much money as possible. Part of the way, though, and, and that's an added value we always uh, um, are happy to provide our clients, is to, to be able to, to, to plan ahead. Um, and, and I'll be very honest, most of the small companies aren't really able to put together a, a five-year or even a two-year plan for their research and development. Um, they're not sure exactly how to work out. One of the first steps you must take is to plan ahead, to know which parts of what you do will come in when. So you can plan into the review process that does take time, it'll average about a year before you get the funding if, if you are awarded. So everything needs to be taken into account. Um, another point that really relates, really relates to that um, has to do with the fact that when you look at the entire process, you, you need to weigh in um, uh, both uh, your, your existing investors, uh, many clients will have, or many, many companies will have some investors, be it angels or VCs, etc., uh, pointing their, their focus into one specific type of their uh, products or their lead product mainly, but then you can use these type of awards to try and help you create a pipeline, uh, robust your organization and create value to increase, to increase the strength of your organization. Um, looking into the NIH 2012 budget, and of course there is no 2013 budget yet, uh, as it was not approved yet, but we're, we're, you know, it's expected to be pretty much the same. I think the interesting po point is um, to see that, that only 11% of, of, of the $30.9 billion of NIH budget are going to the intramural um, uh, process, their internal research. Um, and, and the majority of the, of the funding, of the money that they have, does go out to support different research programs and, and, and research um, uh, grants and, and contracts, etc., that would support companies and, of course, academic research as well. Um, as far as that is concerned, you must keep in mind that a lot of the people have kind of a misperception within industry as to the relevance of different funding sources within NIH, different mechanisms to their research and or to the, their or their, their eligibility issue as, as it goes. Um, Many people view the SBAR to be the only source of funding for companies. This is a, a, a huge misperception. Um, the SBAR is a good program, but it's only 2.5% of the entire budget available. Uh, and, and within the SBAR, there are many limitations, both in terms of where money could go or who could get the funding. It's not only for small companies, but for example, virtual companies will not be able to get SBAR money. Um, so, so everything else beyond SBAR, or almost everything else beyond, beyond SPR, you're eligible to as well. And, and you must remember that. True, you will have to compete with uh, academics to get the money for an R01 or an R21. But if your science is strong enough, you can, if you can make a, a good case, um, uh, bring in your, your strength and, 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 and show how you deal with your weaknesses, you will get R01s, you will get R21s, U01s, etc. Um, these funding sources are available and, and you could step, you know, bring them in to support you as well. Um, this is a breakdown of the of the NIH budget last year, um, and beyond the you know the red uh, headlines there about cancer and, and neuroscience and infectious diseases all get you know billions and billions of dollars. Um, I, I want you to pay attention to the very first column on, on the left, and, and I'm not sure if you can read, read that, but it, it rates clinical research. A lot of the people think that NIH does not support clinical work. Well, just take a look at that. They they do. Um, I'm not saying every uh, clinical work, every clinical project that you have will, get, will be funded necessarily. Uh, and of course, that, rep that very large column does represent um, uh, a s fewer projects uh, compared to the others because each of those very large uh, clinical projects will, will need a lot more money. But then again, if you go through the process, if you're able to present your science, if you're able to, to identify the right opportunity, mainly solicited properly for, for a, a large clinical project, you will be able to get funding from NIH as well to support clinical work. Um, this, is, this is actually very interesting, and, and as we were preparing um, in late December for this uh, presentation, we were surprised to, to, see, uh, to see that. Um, it may not be very clear from this, from this graph that we took out of the, uh, the NIH um, uh, website, but um, last year, in, in 2012, of two things that are, are very, very interesting happened. The first thing, uh, the number of submissions in, continued to increase. So a lot more people uh, applied. 
uh, submit applications to NIH. And, and that actually does make sense if you look at the industry, if you see that there, there isn't as much money around, etc. But at the same time, both the success rate and the per award um, uh, dollar amount went up very slightly, but still went up a little bit last year. And that's a very encouraging sign. Um, um, I, think, I think that was not expected when we were last year, um, uh, talk, last year talking about um, the 2012 budget or looking into what could be the, the happening in, in 2012. And, and this is definitely very, very encouraging. And, and this is the SBAR breakdown, and, and that is even, even, even more interesting. If you look at the, at the SBAR uh, graph, um, the, the increase in success rates for between 2011, that really was the lowest of the low, um, in, into, um, into 2012 is, is quite a significant increase. Um, and again, very, very interesting. Um, I, th I think it, it is important to, to mention uh, when we discuss SBAR that at least from, from our perspective, I doubt an SBAR phase one is, is worth the trouble if you're not gonna, gonna go ahead and, and follow through with a phase two. Uh, the success rates on the phase twos are significantly higher. Um, and, and of course, the money is is is, is a lot, you know is, is there, um, and so just for that hundred or one hundred fifty thousand dollars available for the phase one, um, going through uh, about a six or ten percent success rate um, uh, to compete for for your SBAR phase one, not worth the trouble if you're not going to go through and, and follow with with a phase two to try and get as much money as possible out of this program. Um, Last slide, I think, that, that refers to the NIH statistics. Um, uh, again, very interesting. While in 2011 we saw um, um, both established and new time uh, and first time uh, uh, some uh, researchers submitting to NIH having pretty much the same success rate, al almost no difference there. Uh, you can see that uh, when, when um, uh, all through 2012, uh, there was an increase in the success rate for the established researchers, and I think that is pretty much due to experience, to their knowledge of the system and to the way they, they know how to react and respond to program officers and to the system of the um, NIH. Um, while within industry, especially as you look into non-SPAR type awards, um, there isn't a lot of, of experience within industry. I think there are ways to, to try and bridge this gap and, and bring in experience, whether through your uh, collaborators uh, within academia, through through uh, uh, people like you know Freeman, etc., to try and, and, and bridge that gap and, and put yourself in a better position, understanding the system, knowing what to expect and how to present science to these reviewers to, to maximize your, your chances. Um, now this is my favorite slide um, in, in, in the in the um, in the slide deck, and, and I think um, this really is the bottom line as far as the industry is concerned. Um, both in 2010 and 2011, we don't have yet the 2012 numbers. Um, the overall direct investment or awards of NIH and DoD into life science companies, and, and we did not include in this in this in these numbers the 7.5 billion, does not include. Uh, companies being subcontractors on academic awards. These are direct funding uh, to companies. Um, uh, NIH and DOD in, uh, invested or awarded more money than the entire VC community put together. Um, uh, and, and that is a striking, striking number here, uh, a, a striking fact. Uh, I think, it, you know, any CEO, any company I know, especially the small ones, when they go about to try and raise money from, from uh, investors, from, from VCs, they'll, they'll take their time, they're bringing the best consultants around, they'll put together the best presentation they can and probably go to every conference, not only to the JP Morgan or Showcase, they'll go to every conference on earth to try and present their, their science to VCs to try to bring in money for their company. Um, usually the very same individuals when looking into non dilutive funding representing a significantly higher uh, 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 amount of money available uh, will take a, kind of a lottery ticket approach. We'll try once, maybe twice, see if it works. Um, you know, try to, to come across some, some funding opportunity that may or may not be of relevance for them. Not really do a thorough and systematic um, process, um, and, and, and you know, and obviously they'll, they'll fail. If you take a, a multiple submission process into account, if you're able to take it in the very same serious manner that you will take VC funding, um, there's no doubt you'll be able to get significant amounts of money out of this uh, huge and, and great source of funding. Uh, but it takes work, it takes uh, a systematic approach, uh, it takes a full understanding of what's available and what could be of relevance for you, um, and, and to that extent, being able to bring in funding um, 
from, from these different sources that will support your strategy rather than, than try to identify some funding opportunities that will take you away. Um, uh, in, in this context, one needs to remember that uh, a great majority of the NIH funding is actually non-solicited. So if, if you just screen through the, the grants.gov and the solicitations, the BAAs, RFAs, RFPs, PAs, etc., this will not give you an accurate um, um, uh, presentation of what's available. A lot of money, most of the money in fact, is under unsolicited or investigator-initiated type awards, and one needs to approach program officers, talk to them, see whether this is of relevance and interest to them, your particular project, and to what extent it is, and, 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 and based on, on these kind of discussions, you're better uh, in a better position to, to submit your application uh, and to increase your chances for success. This, this slide really um, depicts only the industry academic partnership, but, but it's pretty much true for any kind of collaboration that you may have. And every, every company uh, uh, within the life sciences has great collaborations. And, and um, uh, you know, almost every company has its roots in academia. It has maybe some uh, founders still uh, on, their, on their advisory board or somewhere else uh, where you know, you're in touch with. Any kind of collaboration with academia or with any other company could be leveraged through different partnership programs or, or STTRs or even just as a straightforward you know, R01 could be leveraged to bring in money. Uh, when you approach, take a systematic approach into, into non dilutive funding, I would list your different collaborators, understand what their strength is, and try to pick each and every project that, that you can identify um, uh, represented by these collaborations to be submitted as, as a different application to, to NIH or to any of the other institutes. Um, so really important to, to understand the importance of these, these collaborations um, and take advantage of them. Uh, just a few words of uh, finalizing our NIH part here um, about the review process. It is, it is important, I think, to remember that the review at the NIH is conducted um, by external individuals to the organization, uh, uh, that they're not really uh, reachable, you cannot talk to them uh, or, or discuss things with them on the one hand, but at, at the same time, um, it is the, the, the importance and weight of the program officers uh, must, be, must be acknowledged as well. So, so when, you re when an application is being reviewed, um, one must take into account the fact that to a great extent this is not a pure scientific discussion. In, instead, this is kind of a risk evaluation. They really want to see great science. They really want to see innovative of uh, uh, science and projects presented them, great significance, but you really need to reduce the risk associated with giving money to you or to your project. You need to make sure that you present your strength on the administrative aspects, on your budget, uh, the, the, the capabilities of the team, the collaborators, and how you would work through that um, um, to be able to maximize uh, uh, your, your chances. You have to both uh, present your strength uh, from the scientific part, but also reduce, reduce the risk associated with it. Um, this is especially true with the very large and complex projects, the 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollar projects that you submit. Don't only ask um, the, the scientific question. It's not only about whether uh, your science is great and, and, and your researchers can really you know, do, do wonders uh, in the lab, but it's, it's also about whether they can manage 50 million dollars or 10 million dollars or even 5 million dollars. And that's not an easy question to answer. Um, many times when uh, researchers, when people write applications, they don't address these administrative parts or, or lesser part, parts, if you will, uh, in, the same, in the same serious manner. An application must come together. It really must represent every aspect, scientific, budgetary, justification to budget, administrative flow of information, commercialization, if, if it's part of the application. Um, it need, needs to present a complete package, taking into account every aspect of it uh, for you to be able to win, take into account you're, you're competing against the best uh, when submitting an application. Um, by all means, I'm sure every research project is, is a, you know, represent great, great science. But then again, there are, there are many of those that they will review and you need to be competitive. Uh, I'm just going to briefly uh, um, say two words about BARDA because uh, obviously uh, we will have Dr. Gary Disbro uh, at 2.30 and, and, and he will be able to, to and he knows a lot more, and he will be able to, to, to discuss this to a great extent. Um, I think, though, that the place that BARDA takes within the, the, the continuum uh, between uh, early stage or discovery and up to the uh, later stages um, of, of, of research and development support is, is an important place um, and really needs to be acknowledged. Um, um, again, I will let uh, um, the 2.30 uh, presentation by Gary Disbro discuss the details of it, but, but this is a really important um, uh, program uh, institute and a great uh, 
uh, different BAAs, broad agency announcement available and ready uh, for people who may be of relevance scientifically uh, to be submitted and, and definitely needs to be taken into account and, and seriously. Uh, when you look at DOT again, there, there's, there's some uh, different funding opportunities people will not necessarily associate with DOD necessarily. This is not always a, a military oriented or battlefield oriented uh, stuff that they will fund. And, and you need to, to investigate, you need to go through the different solicitations, the different BAAs to understand exactly what's available and how to approach them. Uh, the, the process, the review process and submission process is slightly different, I'll discuss that um, in a bit, but there, there is money available to support uh, uh, life science research and development uh, within DOD in different places and different programs. Um, as one of the important ones, of course, is the CDMRP, uh, and, and these are just listing some specifics, um, uh, like the 12 million um, uh, award for can breast cancer program, or prostate cancer program, or, or ALS research. These would not necessarily be um, automatically or instinctively associated with the, with the military, but through DOD you can get funding for this, and not, not many researchers are aware of the fact that, that such funding sources are available for their um, for their programs and, and, and projects. Um, BA 31, I'm sure many of you um, are aware of it. Uh, again, it's uh, replacing the 12 one uh, of last year, and it's a great, great program focusing on um, different specific uh, uh, fields of research. Uh, they're all listed here, like military infectious diseases, combat casualty care, etc. Um, the process is, is slightly different when you're approaching uh, these, usually uh, an initial um, a pre-application of white paper needs to be submitted, followed by an re internal review by, by the uh, program officers. Um, and then those applications, those pro proposals that are uh, uh, seen to be of greater value will be asked to submit a full application. Um, DITRA, though, has its own focus uh, uh, with both uh, basic research uh, work that, that you, can, you can definitely uh, get significant funding from, um, and DARPA uh, is the last one I'll, I'll mention here, um, has a very uh, specific uh, focus, although Bar uh, DARPA is not uh, only life science oriented, they do support a significant number of, of life science projects. Um, their their you know, take is, is slightly different, looking into very um, innovative projects, high risk, high reward type projects. Uh, but again, I think, I think the importance is to, to bring in all different uh, perspectives, all different types of awards and mechanisms that could be of relevance for a specific project to be able to maximize one's potential. Um, and as mentioned earlier, uh, when you go through the DOD uh, submission process, you need to go through a two-stage process, uh, the white paper first and then a full application if, if invited. Um, you should take into account that uh, going through the white paper is probably harder from a success rate perspective than to get the full uh, uh, application awarded uh, if and when you are invited to submit a uh, full application. Uh, so the challenge is really with putting together two to five pages that will represent fully your, your project. Um, many people will kind of you know, look at it as, as, as a quick job, just putting together some, some presentation that they have available or using some white papers that they have available. Uh, this needs to be drafted in a very, very uh, specific way and at least in our experience, uh, writing five pages uh, that really make good sense and present the entire scientific project and budget and plan uh, is probably a lot harder than, than doing so with 400 pages of the full application. So um, one needs to, to, to invest a lot of time and a lot of thinking in the, in the, in the, into the white paper prior to, to submission. Um, I, I think we all know the different uh, private foundations that are available. Uh, I'm just listing a few here, but I, I think what's important to remember as far as non funding and the private foundation um, is that in the past year or so, maybe two years, uh, many of them have shifted slightly from the pure non place that they're used to being, like NIH, like DOD, uh, HHS, etc. Some of them will take, uh, will ask for ma matching funds, some of them will take some uh, IP uh, uh, or royalty um, as part of their, of their deal, and, and you need to be aware of that as you approach them. Still, this could be great funding and, and wonderful sources, uh, but, but you need to be aware of the, of the different uh, criteria and the different needs that they'll present you with to be able to get, get funding from them. So just to summarize uh, my part of, of, of the day, the way we see it at Freemind and the work we try to do 
uh, is focused, and, and, and Guy will elaborate on that very, very, very soon, um, is try to take a two-step approach, uh, 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 two, two core ideas, if you will. The first is to take a strategic approach to, to non only funding. You must acknowledge different institutes' views. You must understand that uh, you know, NIH defines a project in a very different way than a company. A company will see a project as something starting, you know, when they buy some IP and ending when they sell that IP and make profit, hopefully. NIH will look at it very differently. We'll try to cut out um, a very specific part of it with a very specific uh, scientific starting point and a very specific scientific endpoint. And we'll focus only on that part. Um, and, and, and your project, the way a company will define it, will hold many different uh, projects as NIH will define it. So just translating your, your perspective into what they, they, they see and how they view things is really crucial to you being able to, to submit. Uh, you need to recognize a long-term R&D plan and then identify every funding opportunity that will support this R&D plan ahead of time so you can plan for it. So you can take into account the review process, a 12-month that it will take to get you the funding if you are awarded. Um, you have to pick the right funding opportunity for the particular project. You could take any particular project and, and, and try to spin it from, you know, tell the story in different ways. The science will stay the same, but, you know, going for um, uh, NHLBI, going for NCI, or going for, for NIDIB with a specific uh, uh, medical device, for example, that could be of relevance to all, will take different stories. If you tell the NIDIB the, uh, the story, it will focus on the technology development of the platform of the device itself. If you take the NCI approach, for example, you'll focus on the cancer application of the device. Um, the science may be the same, but the story you will need to tell will be different, and you need to acknowledge that as you write the application, as you prepare yourself uh, for it. And then you need to plan the multiple submission process. It will not be a one-time shot. You will not be able to win. Most people will not win their first application. But if you take a, syst a systematic multi-submission approach, you will be able to bring in significant amounts of money. The other part is, of course, how you present your science. You have to know your weaknesses. You have to acknowledge them. Not only tell the story, you know, uh, step one will lead to step two, will lead to step three, etc., but also be able to, to present your challenge, your, your, your weaknesses, the challenges in the science and how you will deal with them, the different alternatives of working through that. Um, you need to, to, to find the right partners. Don't just drop names there of, of great scientists who may or may not be able to submit a letter of, of, of intent there, but also uh, be able to bring them in, in the right way as part of the project and be able to, to show that your PI can manage all these different individuals. Um, and you have to address the non-important the administrative parts, the budget in the right way, uh, itemize it in the right way and justify it in, in the right way. Going through these different, different aspects, taking into account the risk uh, um, uh, assessment uh, process of the review will definitely put your application in a much better position um, to win. Uh, as mentioned, FreeMind has 35 full-time employees basically broken into two groups, a group of analysts, uh, the guy our, our chief analyst had, um, and a group of writers and managers. Uh, and together we try to address both these aspects for our clients. Um, guy is, uh, is our chief analyst, he's been uh, with us for uh, three four years now? Years. Four years now. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> um, and and um, um, really is, is, is knowledgeable on, on different aspects, works with different program officers on a regular basis, reviews a uh, dozen of, 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 of projects, scientific projects in all fields and, and, and perspectives uh, all year round, and he's able to present our clients with different funding opportunities. Um, so uh, basically, just like uh, Ram told, uh, told you all, um, I think we can roughly divide our services into two core uh, services. The first one is the strategic assessment process, uh, which you can see here. Uh, of course, the first part of, uh, of us is really to get to know your company, your needs, uh, where you're coming from, and where you're going to be in five years, because most of the grants and contracts are for five years. Um, so really, the first, uh, the first step is really to understand your needs. Uh, after that, um, we will generate a list of uh, opportunities, really an initial list of uh, funding opportunities for your needs, and from that moment on, it's a back and forth discussion with the company, with our clients, um, just in order to see, you know, to find the right fit um, for the first uh, submission. And, and again, like Ram said before, uh, to construct um, a multi applications strategy in order to really um, uh, fulfill all you need in terms of uh, funding of your project. Uh, if needed, we can also um, help you in putting one pages if needed. Uh, just in order to really define the project, because what you define as a project is not necessarily what uh, 
um, agencies will define as projects. You know, uh, developing a drug is not a project. Okay, that's the whole concept of the company, um, etc. So, and the next and the next stage will be really to, to have the strategic plan. Um, so that's the first course that we have. Uh, after we have identified a specific solicitation we have, and we have defined uh, specific aims for that solicitation, we move on to the second uh, service that we have, the second call service, and that's actually uh, developing uh, the application. Uh, we will assign you with one of our brand consultants or, you know, I'll have um, an amazing experience from writing application and consulting on application and developing the application, uh, and they will guide you through the process. Uh, okay, we will uh, develop the, the initial templates and graphs for, for the company based on any material that you will provide us. Uh, and after that, it's a, it's a back and forth process. Okay, and as many, as many drafts that we will have, uh, that will enable us to have an airtight application with a good scientific story, with good budget. Uh, and that, of course, leads us to, to another section that we have in the application. The scientific story is not the only thing we have to tell. We also have to tell um, the budget and, and the environment because the review criteria for, for different agencies is not only the scientific one. So we really have to have a good uh, application. So that's basically the two uh, core services that we have uh, in mind at the professional department. Uh, now, as you all know, we're going to have a roundtable discussion, so I want to give you some appetizers for what we're going to discuss later on. But of course, it's an open discussion, and if you want to discuss whatever it is, I mean, I'm open. So let's start with the, uh, with the cancer environment, um, the oncology environment. So uh, the R01, R21, SBIR, we all know, are all familiar with that. Uh, we'd like to introduce you with the IMED program. That's uh, really the, the high risk, high reward type of, of research uh, funded by the NCI um, for technology, for medical devices, um, both for uh, academics in order to you know, develop uh, new tools for research, but also for uh, treating patients with the different uh, cancers uh, that can be found. Usually a two-stage um, type of research, uh, beginning with R21, that's the high risk, high reward. After you complete the R21, you can also submit an R33, uh, the equivalent of a phase two application with the SBIR uh, to some extent. Um, like Ram said before, the CDMRP, also a really good uh, pocket of money for uh, oncology research. Uh, DOD supports research in, um, in breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and prostate cancer. Uh, many program, programs uh, starting from really the, the early stage research all the way to clinical trials. And Ram mentioned before the $12 million uh, clinical trial uh, contract with the CDMRP for breast cancer. Um, the next issue is, of course, infectious diseases. Um, the first question that we always ask um, are you dealing with a biodefense pathogen or not? Uh, if yes, um, if, if the answer would be yes. So, um, you should follow and submit an application to NIH, rather DITRA or DARPA. And if the answer is no, again, NIH is always a good uh, possibility. And also uh, the US Army as well, because the difference between the US Army and DITRA is the US Army uh, will not deal um, with uh, biodefense, and DITRA will uh, deal with uh, biodefense uh, pathogens. Uh, DITRA will support from early stage all the way to uh, clinical trials, usually uh, utilizing the contract mechanism and not the grant mechanism. Uh, BADA, I guess we will hear all about it later on today. Uh, DARPA, uh, the equivalent of Q from James Bond, if you remember. Uh, really uh, cr crazy science, uh, just as long as you can justify it. 1% uh, uh, of success maybe in the near future or the far future. Really just think about Q. That's, well, if you have sci science uh, equivalent to Q, so you should go ahead and submit to DARPA. Uh, and then I get from basic science, really from discovery all the way to, to uh, medical devices, um, the past few years, the, the new buzzwords about uh, medical devices will be uh, utilizing all sorts of nanotechnology um, uh, assets that the company may have in order to, to construct a, a new medical device for diagnostic and for treatment. So um, uh, the bioengineering, the NIDIB, the NIDIB issued uh, um, a list of uh, funding opportunities in that environment. Uh, I have here one example, that's the Bioengineering Nanotechnology Initiative. Um, greater amount of money, um, but of course, um, if you're not dealing with nanotechnology, you can always apply for an R01 or R21 and other SBIRs. And of course, each institute also has specific um, funding opportunities for medical devices, just a matter of you know, find the right match for you. And neurological disorders, 
Um, the NIH and DOD both support the neurological disorders. Um, the NIH um, will support uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, ADHD, PTSD, uh, developmental disorders, and stroke, etc., and, and all other um, and all other disorders. The DOD will fund research that relates to the family of the soldier and the VA. So we are talking about uh, the, the veteran, the veteran as well. So we are talking about PTSD, ADHD, and autism, and TBI, of course. Um, again, another example, um, the NIA, that's the National Aging Institute, or the National Institute for Aging, um, has put, has put a lot of emphasis on Alzheimer's research. Next week we're going to have a free big um, solicitation with you um, to support Alzheimer's disease, uh, beginning from early stage all the way to phase two clinical trials. Um, but this is uh, another example for a year one application. This is an ongoing uh, solicitation with three deadlines. Uh, per year uh, to support um, Alzheimer's research. Uh, but then again, if you take a closer look, you'll see that it's $1 million per year, not the usual uh, half a million dollar per year in direct cost. So this is a big application, uh, three cycles every 